First of all, who am I? My name is Peter Huffer, I work for Red Hat. Um, I'm 90% of my time I spent these days as well developing or maintaining Lim input, but I'm still the maintainer for the XORG input stack as well. That includes the, the, uh, um, the XORG itself, the, the effort drives, and after driver input. But these days, almost everything goes into Lim input. I'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, people like to talk about me and IC a lot. Usually, what they say is something like this. <laughs> so I would like at this point to apologize to anyone who felt ignored by me or will feel ignored by me over the next couple of years. Um, I'm usually asleep whenever you guys are awake. I don't know why you guys keep some good time zones. There is another person sort of involved with this talk, uh, Benjamin over here. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm, into, I'm talking about is also a large contribution from him. He does all the terminal space stuff, other than all the user space stuff. Um, in this case is a software engineer Red Hat, same thing. Um, multi-touch and pick, multi-touch and the kernel, core maintainer for pick core, and he is actually the one you can ping during the day, or at least for the European days. Uh, doesn't quite work as well for me. Alright, with that, let's go straight in. Let's go back to the beginnings. Um, a couple of 10,000 years ago, life was a lot easier. We had a few tools, and life was most about banging rocks against the heat. We fast forward about 10,000 to 100,000 years, and life is a lot more complicated. What we have now is input devices, we have keywords, Keepers with LEDs, keepers with profiles, we have mice, mice with wheels, switchable resolutions, hardware profiles, LEDs, we have tablets with proximity, without proximity, that switch to tool and button press, integrated tablets, external tablets, removable ones, built-in ones, with the touch pads with buttons, without buttons, circular touch pads with an extra edge on and ends on support, we have touch screens, every one of you has one of those, I suspect, and zones and support. So it's a little bit more complicated than the fact that we're just hanging on to these things. What I'm going to be talking about today is not necessarily the code or the deep technical things. Um, if you're really interested in those, come see me after the talk and make you regret it. Um, <laughs> I'll be talking about, in general, like a couple of things, what we've been doing over the last couple of years. And I'll also be explaining why we're doing things a certain way or why we're doing the things that we're doing. What I'm also going to try to answer is the question of like, why are you still working on this? So I started getting involved with X in 2006. I've been the maintainer for most of the stuff since about 2007 or something like that. Um, it's still the full-time job for me, which is great because it pays the bills. Um, but yeah, a lot of people actually ask, us, like, it's just input, why are you still working on this? Or why is it still not working? It turns out it's actually a little bit more complicated than you would think. So one of the reasons is hardware keeps evolving. More subtly than other hardware, because you don't see a lot of specs, but the touchpad in 2007, 10 years ago, was able to take, detect one finger. If you were lucky, you would detect, say, things like finger width, or you would have a pit flag to say there's a second finger down. Touchpads were relatively small. Um, they had separate physical buttons that you could click and detect. Sometimes they had an edge scroll, so on, and so on and so forth. Fast forward to now, the average touchpad supports five plus fingers. The plus is usually not necessarily necessary, but some of them do. Um, we have perfect finger pressure, we have sometimes we have perfect finger touch size and orientation, so the upper touch pads can actually all, uh, detect finger orientation. <coughs> um, touches regularly see 10 by 10 centimeters, whatever that is in inches, I don't know. Um, we, the whole touch pad usually clicks, so you don't necessarily have separate physical touch, uh, buttons anymore, you actually have the whole touch pad. We've got two finger scrolling, we have gesture support sometimes built into the firmware, we have some built in palm detection and what's all on the support. So the touch pad from 10 years ago is significantly different to what we have now. Users' expectations have changed. Ten years ago, most of you would have had a desktop and maybe a laptop. Now, as all of you will have a laptop and maybe a desktop. Which also means that touchpads, for example, went from this is a device that I use whenever I'm on the road or something, um, went to this is a primary device because I'm using my laptop all the time. Touch screens are only present. How many of you have a smartphone with a built-in touch screen? Probably all of you or almost all of you. But all the expectations on how a computer in general should work have changed. 10, 15 years ago, it was completely acceptable to say, oh, I just reboot it five times and maybe it will work after that. <laughs> Software stack has changed. A uh, big elephant in the room is Wayland. Wayland just shifted a whole lot of, whole lot of old posts, which gave us basically all the motivation to start from scratch and start building something proper. The X of input drivers, uh, also thanks to me, almost close to being unmaintainable. They're just very, very complex, and it doesn't help that the carpet keeps changing and the drivers can't really keep up. Uh, we've learned a lot trial and error. Um, it's called trial and error for a reason. No one says trial and success because you don't want to learn when you make mistakes. 
we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. Um, you can guess why. And one of the examples that I'm just going to give now is like 10 years ago, the XOR input stack was very much like a box of Lego. You would throw it at the user and say, yeah, yeah, just figure it up, put it together, it might, it might not work. 2007, we had 31 different input drivers in X, most of which would only work with one device. 10 years later, we have four that are still active now. Um, we have AppDev Synaptics, both of these are in maintenance mode now, so they don't really see a lot of features anymore. We've got the walking drive, which is, which is still maintained, and we've got the input as an X driver on top of the actual mid input. I suspect that in three years' time, we'll only have one driver left that's active and maintained, and whatever ships in RHEL. And I think the walking drivers will keep getting, uh, walk guys will keep getting added, but everything else, with the way the progression moves on, we'll all switch to the input. The biggest thing is, and that's why I picked the, um, pick the box of Legos, is that the drivers were really just as isolated pieces. So you had two drivers, you had one for your keyboard, and you had one for your touchpad. And they didn't talk to each other because they didn't know about each other's existence. So in X, unless you're using the input, to this day, if you want to disable while typing, so you want to disable the touchpad while typing, you need a user space process that connects to the X server, basically monitors the keyboard, so it's more or less a keyboard sniffer, and whenever it sees activity on the keyboard, it sends a property to the driver, which then disables itself, and later on you send another property, which then re enables itself. That makes no sense. But that's what you get when you just have a box of leg and you kind of have to build something. Um, there's, an interesting, <laughs> there's an interesting anecdote about Legos. While I was looking for that picture, um, I went to the Lego shop, and in the Lego shop you can order bricks. And when you order bricks, there's like a little drop down box on the side, and it lets you choose the color. So it turns out that there's less colors of Lego. Lego has less colors for Lego bricks than the Synaptics drive at long configuration. <laughs> so you can see where it gets a bit messy. <laughs> Just works. That is pretty much what we're trying to go for. Um, so pretty much all the work we're doing is is supposed to boot into your laptop, and regardless what hardware you have, regardless what specific works that hardware needs, it should just work out of the box without a lot of configuration. Um, works most of the time. Sometimes. Okay. That was the intro. Let's go a little bit into the uh, technical stuff. What actually drives the input devices? On the average desktop stack, you have four components that matter in terms of input handling. You've got the kernel, which is always the most basic layer. The kernel translates binary gobbledygook into something usable. So you get some bit streaming that is usually some hardware protocol, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the kernel translates that into something that's consumable by, by a user space. For example, it is a touch at position 1, 2, 3, 4. The first layer in the stack is the input which is usually linked into the compositor, so it's not a separate item anymore. But libinput converts that hardware state that the kernel gives it in a very generic manner into something that is a low-level event, so something that you can actually consume. So it goes from, on a touchpad, for example, the kernel says there's a touchdown at this position, but libinput is then interprets that as like, okay, that, that is the start of two finger scrolled event, for example, and it gives it scroll event. Compositor, in the normal case, that's mother and, and non shell um, together. They take those low-level events that are already pre-processed, pre so you kind of go, yes, they're generic. Uh, interpret them, so for example, if you get a, uh, the input will give you a motion, say, like move 10 pixels to the right, the composite and says, okay, Perse is currently here, we we'll move 10 pixels to the right. And sometimes it, it consumes it as well, so if you have the overview and you start scrolling, the composite is actually the one that consumes it, because it will scroll through the version desktop sensor and so forth. Finally, we have the toolkit, and that's the one that eventually receives the toolkit. These days, toolkits do a lot more than back in the 10 years of X days. So kinetic scrolling is one example. So you might get a scroll event. GTK says, oh, you're scrolling at this particular speed. Therefore, I'm going to start that kinetic, that initial scroll. Um, I'll have a few examples of the kernel work that we've been doing over the couple of uh, years, last couple of years. So Benjamin is mostly working in the HIT layer. So HIT is, is a hardware protocol that's now, I think, 20-ish years old, or since the very first revision. Um, in mostly pushed by Microsoft. And at some point, Microsoft realized that it's not particularly useful to have every single device require a new driver. And for those of you in the Windows 95 days, Windows 98 days, when you plug in RC, whoops, now you have to download the driver. Except for Windows 95, you didn't have actually an internet, so you have to figure out where the driver's in was. So they started with the auto-descriptive protocols. In this particular case, the device says, okay, here's a whole lot of features that 
that writes can do, and then we'll send you events based on those features. Which means that you can write one generic driver to all the model. It's great. Except when it doesn't. Um, it still allows you to have a lot of proprietary behaviors in there. Um, in the kernel source, the uh, driver's hit directory is 130 files, of which four or six of them are something of a generic one, and the rest is just work up the work up the special hand and have a special hand. But still, most of the work goes into like one big generic driver that can be all this new. Once a test story related to HIT that we had a couple of kernel releases ago, was to be Wacom rework. So Wacom drivers used to have a USB driver, mostly because Wacom predates the existence of a useful HIT driver in the kernel. They've been around forever. So they had a USB driver, but every single time Wacom released a new device, they had to at least add the USB IDs to the driver, because otherwise the device wouldn't work. Which means Wacom released the device where the patch had to go upstream, had to get merged, had to get into the next kernel release, and then four months later you could you could finally use that one device that you have just released, even though the patch itself may have just been like two lines. Um, so one of the things that Benjamin did was he basically moved that from the USB driver into the hit core system. And the effect is that now, Wolfen drive, Wolfen devices are actually called hit anyway, or some, some version of it, is that now we have auto detection on these features, auto detection on these devices, which means this is the first time that you might be able to buy a Wolfen tablet, plug it in, and it will just work straight out of the box without any kernel updates needed. Um, it even goes to the point that, because we have fairly good contacts with the, the Wacom Linux engineers, that the, uh, the firmware is not being tested. So they're making sure that the firmware doesn't actually screw up our drivers. Um, so it just works out of the box. So that's a nice success story. Um, another thing that's been going on for quite a long time now is uh, RMI4. RMI4 is the, uh, the second protocol that Synaptics touched that support. Um, Synaptics used to traditionally were connected all over PS2. PS2 in 2007 makes hit and drive. You can find a hit that is interested in other protocols. Um, the biggest problem with PS2 is it's slow. There's not enough bytes to transmit more than two fingers, and even two fingers, usually the port rate goes down and it's support. So a couple of years ago already, Synaptics have, have added, have switched to a new protocol called RMI4. It took us forever to get that going, but at this point, this, I think 4.12 is when it's enabled across the bank now, which means that if you have a touch, if you have a laptop that's, say, less than three years old, um, once you update to the 4.12 kernel, your touch will be properly 5 minute capable, will report to the faster rate with a precise sensor and support. Um, touch bits, just little details on the side, touch bits are these days are usually connected by multiple hardware buses. So for example, the one I have in here is connected by PS2 and SM bus. Um, if you have a Dell one, the problem is uh, I2C, but still have the PS2 fallback and so on and so forth. So that's just um, two, three examples for, for the public kind of kernel. In terms of user space, almost all the FFT space goes into the input. Um, the input is it's a library that can be used by every compositor. Um, basically what it does is it translates the kernel hardware state that is still fairly device specific into something that is generic across devices. So the, for example, a touchpad, when a sync by the kernel, looks pretty much identical to touch screen. Um, there's not really a lot of difference except the one bit that tells you this is not a touch screen, this is a touch pad. Um, so you just get the touch locations. The input converts that into, into a point of motion, converts it into two finger scrolling, cancel and so forth. So once you once you use live input, you don't actually have to worry about the various hardware quirks anymore. Within live input, we still do so we have like custom acceleration methods just for specific devices. We have custom point of behavior, custom button behavior for specific devices. So even though the kernel gives us a generic protocol, we still have to deal with a lot of hardware specifics. Um, short list of what it actually does, you can look it up later if you find the slide somewhere. Um, LibInput is very much designed with the one library to rule them all. Um, unlike the X server, Lego box that I mentioned before, LibInput is designed by using LibInput for all the input devices, and then if you talk to each other inside the library, it's all magic and whatnot. But there's not really like there's not a lib input and a lib touchpad and a lib touch screen that all kind of not talk to each other. So that approach has so far, lib input is three years old now, has worked out quite well. Um, one of the things we're, we're focusing on, and this is part of the let's just make it work normally or predictable, is that we're focusing very much on predictable behavior. Um, there's some entertaining reading for that. Um, about half a year ago or something, I had to look into how does an Aptix driver accelerates pointers. So point of motion, and it's essentially a fancy random number generator. 
um, to the point where I literally cannot tell me how point acceleration works on your machine unless you tell me your screen size. Because this, the point avoidance at scale, I think three or four times, two of which are two times of which are depending on the screen size, so you literally cannot figure out what the touch pattern is. Uh, in the input, we're pretty much using uh, non-physical references where possible. So you point out that your movement thresholds are in millimeters, your button sizes are in millimeters, and so on and so forth. It makes things a lot easier. Left-handed button configuration is another one. You tell the input, I want, I want my mouse to be left-handed, in case the, uh, it does the right thing. Trying to tell, for example, the synaptics drive that the touchpad is left-handed is entertaining. I think your passing is already smiling. Um, because when you switch a touchpad to left-handed, the buttons will be switched around. But when you then tap, it will send the right click for simply the tap. So you actually have to map the tap button to the right button so that when the right button gets enough to the left button, you get the single thing. Thank you for this. Um, we have, and that's the more controversial thing, we have a lot harder boundaries for feature features. It's not the general kitchen sink, let's just put it in, that will work everywhere. But there's a lot of things where it just said, no, this will not happen with input. You have to do this in the compositor. Which also means that we assume a competent compositor. It's not quite as easy. You can't just sit down on the weekend and we'll write a window manager and hope everything works. We do require the compositor to do quite a lot of things. Uh, things are like touch screen gestures, kinetic scrolling, is now it has to be handled in the toolkit. There's no generic uh, kinetic scrolling anymore. Uh, non default button mappings. The input won't map button one to button eight or something. That is stuff that has to be done about it. The input is still just a hardware abstraction layer. Um, and the biggest change is that we have drawn a line between hardware specific features for configuration and user specific preferences. So with the semantics and the EFT drivers and so on and so forth, a lot of the hardware specific features were configuration options that people could turn on and off, which led to a combinatorial explosion of configuration options because you just couldn't test them anymore. Um, with the input, we have very strict, oh, if something is hardware specific, it will not be configurable. If you have a click pad without physical buttons where you have to press the whole button down, you will get software buttons. Or you will get click fingers, you can choose between the two. But if you have a touch pad that has physical separate buttons, we're not going to give you software buttons. You don't need them, you have physical buttons. So we have internal, we still have a lot of configuration options, but they're all hooking on the specific laptop models, on the specific hardware devices, on the specific types of devices. And then we have comparatively few but still enough, I think, um, user-specific preferences. So things like tapping, or whether you want natural scrolling, there's no clear-cut line of which one is the right thing to do. So that is one of the things that we actually expose. So whenever Living Put doesn't have a lot of configuration toggles, because a lot of it is just taken away, because it's just fixed to the hardware. Um, one of the reasons is that we learned that the hardware, hardware is that any configuration option is a promise of behavior. Once you add a configuration option, you're basically committing that thing will work that way until pretty much forever. Which means that when new hardware comes along, you can't just suddenly say, oh, well, we now have to have that option work slightly differently on that hardware, because you're breaking the behavior of the, of the way the user's expected to, the way the user's configured to. And usually, everyone has read the XKCD workflow comic, where it's like, oh, I've hooked up my space bar, so that the heating of the CPU is interpreted as left click or something like that. This is the, this is the main situation we want to avoid. Um, we want to, basically we want to be able to say, hey, there's new hardware, or we found a better way of doing the same thing, without A, breaking all of these configurations directly, but without also having to worry that someone has got the same XOR.com since 1994 and we can't possibly break this behavior. So one example is with input, we have four different types of power protection just depends very much on the hardware you have, but it's all transparent and it's enabled by default. Um, the one thing is the input is meant to be boring. It's not a research project. You can have a device that you've just invented and it's an Arduino hooked up to some sensor and so on. Live input is not the place to support it. Live input is for mice, for touchpads, for keywords. All the devices are not exciting, or at least if they are exciting to you, or it's um, <laughs> The features in the living are supposed to be boring. They're just supposed to be able to make it usable to use the desktop in a normal manner. There's not going to be anything exciting in here. So again, if that excites you, what does our desktop? Alright, so much for the demo this space. Um, let's talk about a co co two completely, two, three completely different projects. Um, we've been working for two years now on a project called LibRapper. 
right? So it's a little bit more exciting now. Because if you've ever bought a gaming mouse, you will find that the modern gaming mouse actually might have a lot of features. They have multiple profiles, they have computerable up resolutions, some of them interesting enough up to 12,000 dpi. For reference, if you have a pure mouse computer at 12,000 dpi resolution, it means that you know, on the average laptop screen, from the left edge to the right edge, you have four millimeters of physical movement will move all the way. So it's a high precision device. Um, we have profile resolutions can switch on button presses and so on and so forth. We have LEDs that can remap buttons in hardware. Um, you have configurable button, buttons, so you can literally configure the button to send the ABCD key press whenever you press it. So one of the things we wanted there is there's like a whole lot of, you know, in the Windows world, you pretty much download whatever configuration software the, the, uh, the manufacturer has, install it and configure it. Um, we decided one library to rule them all um, because it's not, it's a waste of time if everyone writes a different user interface because there's a lot of effort has to go into making the mouse work to begin with because of course you have not access to the specs. So a lot of people start reverse engineering these mice and then there's like some dodgy UI or something like that that they hook onto but it won't work with the next project that wants to reverse engineer mouse and so on. So with LibRapa we decided we have one library that provides 80% of the most common features that all these devices have. We have the backends to hook into the various hardware and then can have one or two graphical environments, depending on the desktop, to hook onto that, and you get coverage of all the devices. Um, so, they, you know, so the back ends, they're all hidden away again. So we have Logitech for HIT++1, HIT++2. We have G-Spiel, the HIT++2, the Rocker. We're currently planning on hooking up to the Razer and Corsair Linux drivers. Um, I think the Razer one is actually Dbus daemon, so within LibRapac, we'll talk to that Dbus daemon, because um, we don't want to waste all the time reverse engineering something that someone has already done. So one of the, the things for the graphic is we actually do plan to take advantage of other projects that have already done through the paper. Um, the graphic is that they come the graphic as of last week. Um, we don't actually have a library anymore as part of the graphic. We have a debus team in the company. The reason for that is basically that the only way you can write a library that writes the hardware is to come in the group. At which point suddenly, oh, okay, you have a process that's running in root, but the graphical user interface, everybody gets unhappy about that. So we just decided we'd write a DBus daemon that's just sitting somewhere. That's that's writing to the actual hardware, and then you just hook onto the DBus daemon for the actual graphical environment. So as of a week ago, so wrap back B, the DBus daemon is the only installed product of the wrap back. Um, we currently have a good sum of code uh, student, Yente Hitskis working on Piper, which is the, the known application for to interact with the wrapper. And that's one of the screenshots for the um, button configuration. So as you pop all the buttons, the file dots, which on these, and so on and so forth. Um, you can configure them, button zero click. That's actually all the screenshot that looks a bit better now. Um, you can configure the various cubic macros, and so on, and so on and so forth. You can configure the resolutions and the LEDs as well. So if you want the LEDs, in green all day because uh, what we do need if you ever wanted to get into reverse engineering this is reverse engineering light you won't crash your kernel trying to reverse engineer your mass which means it's a lot less frustrating than trying to reverse engineer into your graphics cards for example so if you're interested or you have a gaming mass that you want to get working just talk to us we do need help to get the, the least of devices Separate topic again. Benjamin, most of Benjamin and uh, Husey, I don't know if you've seen it here, or the other one, um, have been working on Logic Unify and Receive of firmware updates. So, Logic Unify and Receive is a little USB on the get when you buy a wireless um, Logitech mouse. Um, that receiver is IoT compatible, Internet of Things compatible, in that there is a uh, workable exploit to take away the computer. Um, so the, the vulnerability is called mouse check. It was discovered I think 2006, -ish, I think it's quite a while ago actually. Um, and basically, it allows anyone to connect to your receiver and then send keystrokes through your computer, which is reasonably inconvenient. <laughs> um, Logitech pushed out a firmware update, but unfortunately, that firmware update only was of course installed on the Windows. So Benjamin and Richard worked together with Logitech to actually make that possible on the on the Linux. So now we have the firmware update for the Logitech Unifying Receiver is in the Linux firmware service. And as of, when was it, a couple of days ago, 
is it posted in Google Plus that over 20, 28,000 people have downloaded the firmware already? And that was like a day after it was disabled. I think in the population it's like somewhere 60,000 now. So that's like another success story. You just want that to work out of the box. You don't have to worry about it. It's just like it just works. All right. Uh, next big topic. Uh, Trusted support. And that's the last big topic I'm going to talk about now. The one thing that Living Input doesn't do is joysticks. Uh, mostly because the average joystick isn't really used to interact with the desktop. Because if you ever try to interact with the desktop with a joystick, you can look on the So the proposal that is currently floating on the way on the list is very much pre-alpha, so the, the, the warning is like the warning is, is something called input FD, creatively named because we have an all descriptive as an input device. Um, the reason why we chose that is that, first of all, we don't actually know how joysticks work. But we do know how they work in hardware, we do know how they're supposed to work in games and everything. But there's a lot of unanswered questions, especially when you write, when you want to write something that's really generic. Um, trying to figure out a generic mapping for joysticks pretty much ends up in, eventually you'll end up in like, hey, I have a device with 27 buttons, and I've got a list of 20 million tags that can describe all these buttons. I have a joystick with 38 buttons, physical. <laughs> so that's not an exaggeration. You'll need to come yeah, up yeah. with a big bug number. I, I, think, I think I vaguely remember in the early 90s, Logitech, was it Logitech? Trustmaster, whatever they called, they had one with 58 buttons at that time. <laughs> it was like a flight stick. It was not so. um, joysticks only interact with the desktop. I mentioned that before. If you ever use the gamepad to like, move the mouse pairs around, it's not the most exciting thing to do. But then again, sometimes, sometimes the afternoon is raining, you've got nothing else to do. Um, and anyway, that's the other thing. Games are actually really, really adamant about not having delays. Uh, it turns out that if your mouse is delayed by, say, 100 milliseconds, your Call of Duty scores go down a little bit. <laughs> um, which means that we don't want the twin joysticks and the game. We don't actually want any layers in between, especially because we're not actually using it anyway. So input is, is born of the idea that why don't we just open the device and hand it to the application like the application? And you say, why do we do that in the first place? Because the application can just open it. And that is what STL does right now. STL has a unit rule where it just opens, the, it changes the permissions on the, on the input nodes for the joysticks. STL opens it directly from the game and, and reads the data. So the only thing we're actually doing is we're changing who opens the file descriptor, but everything else is already in place anyway. So yeah, pink application file descriptor. And the reason for that is input FD, that whole proposal is just about control. There's no other reason for that. It's about control. Specifically, the compositor now controls the input file descriptor to the input device. Which means that the compositor can decide, A, which device is available to a client. So if you have three joysticks connected, it might say that one game only gets access to the two devices, but not the third one. Um, it can decide whether these devices are available right now, because one of them might already be in use in another game at the moment. But most importantly, when these devices are available, Right now, you rely on all the applications just happily closing the file description and they don't want it anymore. With input FD, we've got the chance of that as soon as it switch focus from one from one application to the other, we can close the file descriptor, the application will get any more events from that. And then when you switch focus back, we just hand it here's the new here's the new file descriptor for the same device. So it's literally just about control. There's nothing else to it. It should be fairly this thin layer that's going to be put in it. The actual device handling, as I said, is still in the there's a lot of unanswered questions, which is why it's in pre-alpha. So first of all, how do we handle LEDs on the, on the various devices? Um, how do we handle devices that aren't actually FF devices, so where we don't have a kernel file descriptor? Think a bit of, of the joystick version of a uh, virtual keyboard. You know, like on-screen gamepad or something. We can easily send or make that send FF events, but FF is a lot more about, like, there's a lot of bunch of self-descriptive IO pools in FF and so on and so forth that we can't emulate than just a random file descriptor. So that's one of the things like the, what, what extra data is needed to make this useful? Do games need to know anything else about that device than just having access to its events? So one of the things, one of the, the, the reasons why we have that file descriptor for passing as well is because Flatpak, we can pass the file descriptor into Flatpak, but the application can't call out into the dev, um, dev input system otherwise. So, but we don't have UDEF in the flat pack. So a lot of information that clients otherwise have just by looking at the UDEF properties isn't available within a flat pack. So again, but 
and that's the question. We're like, do we need that data? We don't know. We really need someone. Like, is anyone going to help with this? We need someone who writes games, who writes game frameworks, who actually knows all these things to at least come in and tell us what to do. Because otherwise, we're just going to end up doing something, and everyone's going to be happy. Right. Um, I think that was the last big topic. Um, sorry. So the main goal that we're doing at the moment in the whole input stack is we're just working towards that you should just work out of the box without anyone having to worry about it. There's not a lot of configuration options because usually you don't need them because we know what you should have based on the hardware. We're doing a lot of kernels around, cleanups, moving things around, making sure that generic drivers work. The input is the one shared user space library where you should just take over everything and it should just work. The graph bag is the one shared user space daemon to configure any mouse. Um, as I mentioned, the firmware updates is another one that just, there is a button, you click on it, it updates, done. And yeah, I think of these, the big open question. We want to make joysticks just work again, using the packs of games, we just don't quite know what we need. Thank you. Thank you. I know you said you were all the gaming devices were treated separately, but uh, I, I remember a few years ago there was uh, a, somebody with limited mobility using uh, a, a dance mat as a mouse to uh, to use with a sort of streaming text input. Uh, I mean, there would it be? What would be the case with uh, hardware like that? Um, so my, my first guess is that a Linux terminal has an interface called U input where you can create, based on the textual description, you can create a device that to user space looks like a physical device plug in, and you can make that device look like anything. So we need to use that interface for its test suite, where we just create devices that like look like physical devices and can test all the functional things. So for very specialized solutions like that, my usual goal to is write a wrapper that creates a kernel device that makes it behave the right way, so that the kernel device, the rest of the desktop sees, looks like a generic device. Because these solutions are so specialized that when you want to try to get something generic in, the next person that comes along needs a slightly different one. The general problem with that is a little bit more two people at the same time. So in that case, probably the input of the state is there. It's very much a very specific solution. Okay. And you need for us to run the work. So in your case, you don't have to worry about that. But for any generic solution, you always need like a little bit more something. For the joysticks, is there any collaboration with Valve? I thought they were doing some work on enabling joysticks on Linux. So, to my knowledge, the Steam controllers are handled by Valve, just working directly with keyboard nodes. So, the kernel exposes, in addition to the AFL devices, where the kernel already does the pre parsing and the mapping, you can get access to the raw data that comes out of the device. Valve, because the their, their setup is very different, they don't necessarily have to care about the rest of the desktop as much. So they just hook onto that, they have that one controller to know how it works, and then just read the data directly to the device. We don't, I haven't had any direct collaboration with them yet. Um, but I think they are aware of it. This is still pre alpha, so we, yeah, we're not quite sure what to do yet, which is a bit hard because the company is like, hey, we want to do that, but we don't actually know what we want. So and do they do the same thing for? Any joystick or only for the Steam controller? Thanks. Um, speaking of nutty things, um, keyboards with LEDs on them, uh, where you want uh, like the thing to make an exploding animation when you die, um, is that under the input FD thing or? So, so one, of, one of the side effects from moving. So initially, the iPad was designed to only work on devices that have hardware profiles, so they can store up on the hardware itself. So the advantage is you can unplug it, plug it in another computer with that. So with the move to Rackback to be, we get a couple of, of side benefits that include we can listen to events now within the libraries of the hardware, so we can listen to events, set up events and stuff like that as well. It also gives us the chance to um, continuously update things for the it. Second. But it also gives us a chance to implement software formats. So with the keywords, Benjamin bought one about two, three weeks ago. So one of the entertaining things is for these LEDs to work, you actually have to write to them 60 years a second. So it's not like you just done something and then it just runs, and you literally have to sit there and just do it. 
use your room more to you'll see you will see something um, So yes, the keyboards are now since we switched to the, the Divas demon, the first time they are on the on the horizon. We just like start. Um, do you expect input FD to be the solution for things like steering wheels and virtual reality headsets too? Yes. Um, steering wheels definitely because they're just gaming devices. Um, where input FD gets more complicated and that goes into the there's a few details that we have to out with this. So the PS4 controller has a touchpad built in. So now you can they they show up as two different kind of devices. So you can aim all of the all file descriptors to an application. But you kind of need to tell them that hey, this is the same physical device, this isn't just a touchpad and a physical device. So we need something, we've input internally, this is something called device grouping. So we've, in, we've input will tell the composer of the uh, welcome tablets, for example. You've got a pen, you've got a touch, and you've got a couple of buttons, and we've input is smart enough to tell the composer, by the way, those three devices are the same physical device. We need to figure out a way to get that information to the client. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that, and that goes into the virtual reality thing, is that um, just because the device is a gaming device doesn't mean it should be used for utility, but it goes the other way around as well. You, you might want to direct file descriptor to your mouse in your game so you can't have all the light inside the tool. But under what condition is that supposed to happen? Because then you suddenly go into the composite policy and you have to like pop up and say, do you really want to pass this in or not? And we can't really intercept the events, but we can mask out events. And there's like a lot of little moving parts that we're not quite sure. But basically, the answer is yes. For virtual reality, have you looked? Uh, do you guys follow OpenXR? I don't know if Red Hat is a member of Kronos, but. No, the closest I, I get to virtual reality is that I even work my client. Right, because uh, well, OpenXR right now doesn't exist, but I understand it's meant to be like a common API for VR headsets and inputs and stuff, like OpenGL, so at the, li at the uh, library level, which makes your life different. Yeah, I mean, I only look at input stuff, so OpenGL doesn't really help me. But it's OpenGL for input. Oh, right, okay, yeah. Um, For those of us with way too many devices, what's the best way to get you feedback on how things are working with weird pieces? You mentioned you were looking for input, but not where to send it. Uh, not quite sure. You mean like if you have a hardware that's for a specific device? Yes. So, uh, at the moment, it's mostly part of the market. And I'll get to it. There's a couple of, we have a, uh, the input documentation is a nice link that no one seems to read, but it says like we need to close those doors more far. Largely the things, the, the hardware devices that are brought in that we tend to see at the moment, I think 80 to 90% of my time is spent on touchpads because they don't want to do anything else. But um, in, in terms of uh, logs, we have enough infrastructure to, to get the right logs to fix a lot of the stuff, but often it just comes down to get someone needs to fix that dry like the kernel, and that's usually what we're probably making. So, but first step is always file the bug against the input. For the Libratic reverse engineering, we pretty much figured out. But we can guide you along and say, look, those are the tools if you want to reverse engineer the configuration protocol for the mask. Um, so that's the one you go to Libratic, that's in GitHub. Um, and you just say, look, we want to reverse engineer that. And we can provide some guidance, but in the end, you can kind of be looking at a lot of these details. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, thank you.